Functional programming is an approach to writing code that concentrates all your important logic into reusable, pure functions. And I'll explain what those terms mean in a minute. But first, let's talk about why people use functional programming. And that's versus the main alternative to functional programming, which is object-oriented programming. So whereas functional programming is all about concentrating your code into reusable pure functions, object-oriented programming is all about ordering your code into objects. And those objects can encapsulate their internal state in variables and fields and things like that. Here's an example of object on the left. And here is the same piece of code just written as a pure function. This code is in TypeScript, but lots of languages allow you to write code in both these two different ways. I've got videos on my channel here for writing functional code in JavaScript and in C Sharp, but there are also some programming languages that are specifically designed for writing code in only the functional programming style. So languages like Scala, Clojure, and F Sharp if you're a .NET developer. It's highly likely that the programming language that you use every day will allow you to do functional programming to at least some extent. These days, most of them do. So let's get into those five rules of functional programming. And the first one is the term that I alluded to at the start of this video, pure functions. Pure functions are at the heart of functional programming. A pure function is a function which, given the same inputs, always returns the same output, and it has no side effects. A side effect is something that happens as a result of the execution of the function that you didn't really directly contribute to returning the output. A quick tip for spotting side effects in your functions is to look at the name of the function. So if your function is called something like find biggest item, so this is a function that takes an array and finds the biggest item inside that array according to some kind of logic. Well, if inside this function we're doing anything that isn't directly related to the function name, so anything that isn't directly related to finding the biggest item, then that is most likely a side effect. So here, logging a message to the console, that's a side effect, and that stops this being a pure function. The same is true for functions that transform data or create objects or anything like that. If it's doing anything other than the thing the function name directly says it's doing, then it's probably a side effect and it's probably not a pure function. Okay, on to the second rule of functional programming. As well as pure functions, you also want to focus on immutability. In functional programming, data is immutable when it isn't changed after it's created. So if you want to change an object, then you have to create a new version of that object with the required changes in it. Here we have an example of an object, and this line of code here is mutating that object by changing this property. Well, in functional programming, we want to uphold immutability, then this isn't allowed. If you're doing functional programming and you want this property to be changed, then you have to actually create a new version of this object with that property set to a new value. This goes back to that side effects rule in pure functions as well. If you've got a function that in, takes an object in as an argument, then in functional programming, you should always treat that object as immutable. So don't do this, basically. Setting this property here can be considered a side effect, and side effects make this not a pure function, and therefore not functional programming. So treat all objects as immutable, especially objects that are passed into your functions. Some programming languages have syntax that helps you stick to immutability by actually preventing you from mutating objects. C Sharp, for example, has this record type. If an object is declared as a record, then the compiler will not let you change the fields on it. If you want to set this field on here on a record on C Sharp, then you have to create a new record with those properties set. Another language feature that does this is object.freeze in JavaScript. And I've got another video about object.freeze right up here, but it does the same sort of thing of forcing immutability. Okay, rule number three is statelessness. Functional programming avoids shared state. So this concept implies that functions should rely less on data from outside scope so that's global variables, class fields, static variables, environment variables, that sort of thing. So in this JavaScript, um, this is bad functional programming. Because here, our function is relying on this process.env environment variable inside the function. It'll be much better to actually pass in this environment variable like this, instead of referring to it inside the function. 
Okay, rule four is recursion. Since functional programming avoids mutable state, then loops can be a bit of a problem. A for loop like this actually relies on this mutable result um, variable here. Each time we loop through, we're adding something into this mutable array object. And that goes against rule two of functional programming where we don't like mutability. So a more functional way to write this would be to take advantage of the yield statement. Yield exists in both TypeScript and JavaScript and C Sharp and probably a bunch of other languages as well. And it lets you turn this function into a sequence generator. And a sequence generator is a special kind of function that can be changed together recursively. So you can call a for each over this function and just iterate over the result in the calling code. And you don't need a mutable result variable in there. It just calls the same function recursively. Rule five of functional programming is to use function composition. Composition is a process of combining two or more functions in order to produce a new function or to perform some kind of computation. So for example, if we have a function that doubles a number and a function that adds one to a number, then we can create a new function that takes these two as arguments and returns some kind of composition of the result. So here we're just adding the result of these two functions together, but this could be anything. And it doesn't care what functions you pass in here as arguments, as long as they match this function signature that I put here in TypeScript. And this is the reason I'm using TypeScript for these examples, by the way, because doing this in JavaScript without these types helping you out, um, that can get a little bit crazy and you can lose track of what these things are supposed to be doing and what they're supposed to be returning. So TypeScript allows us to be really clear about what these functions are and that prevents bugs and it makes your code so much more readable. So there we have it. Follow these five rules of functional programming and you'll have cleaner, more maintainable and more reusable code. Hopefully also with fewer bugs. It's worth noting that while these rules form the core of functional programming, real world applications often require some kind of pragmatic bending of these rules. Functional programming encourages you to use these principles where they make sense, but not to the point of making your code unreadable or overly complex. So if you found this video useful, then please do subscribe to my channel. So that's Train to Code here on YouTube. My name's James and I'll see you in the next tips or tutorials video. Yeah.